great. I may just ask a blessing if that's okay. 1 John 4 and 8, it says this. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Because let me tell you this, what the scripture says this, God is love. Amen. Let's say it together. God is love. Amen. Let's ask a blessing over this word. Father, we just thank you for being able to come into your house tonight. We thank you for the love of God that has richly been bestowed upon us. And we thank you, Lord, that we were given the opportunity to respond to that love. We pray for this word tonight that it does not return void, but it does exactly what you have appointed it to do. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to hearts and lives. And God, if they would just walk out of here with a perspective of you and a deeper walk with you, I'd be blessed. And God, how much more would we all be blessed if we walked deeper in your love? And we ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All God's saints said, amen and amen. You may be seated in his presence. Man, I'm going to just cover a few areas tonight uh, about love. And I could have went to the Bible and went to some Bible stories and given you some examples of love. And, and there's so many in there. I mean, you could just talk about Jesus Christ, the perfect picture of love. But I, I really want to talk about our heart tonight and, and where our hearts are and, and what a heart full of love looks like and, and how that is real to us and how in our everyday lives it it relates to us because sometimes, let's be honest, we can look at Bible characters and, and we say, well, that's great what they did, but this is what I'm doing. And so when we look at our own hearts and our own lives, it's not in a judgmental, but it's in a real genuine that God does love us. And, and one of the parts of the, of the Bible that, that we sometimes overlook is when God tells us and, and corrects us, how, you know, I don't like being corrected as much as anybody. And there's a part of me that often gets a little defensive when I'm corrected. Am I alone in that? <laughs> when you get corrected, you don't like it. No, I'm not doing anything wrong. But the reality is, the Bible says that, you know, when he, he loves us enough to chastise us from time to time, to, to get us in the right lanes and stuff. And, and this isn't a, a chastising sermon by any means. But it is to say this, that if the Lord and the Holy Spirit provokes us and, and, and prompts us to repentance, we are always to be quick to repent. Hallelujah. Hey, man, let's, let's just dig in, though, and... The first thing I want to talk about was that whatever that God is so much love, and his goal for us would be to be so full of the love of God um, that we can be just full of God. And, and, and that seems like a simple statement, but when we're full of God, we're full of love. And so those two go hand in hand, and it's almost impossible to truly love someone without having the love of God in you. Now, there's different things that we could do, but it's not necessarily love. And so one of the best ways to gauge how full we are of love is to gauge what comes out of our mouth. Because the Bible says this, that out of the abundance of our mouth, our heart does speak. So our heart's going to say things that's in, or our mouth is going to say things that's in our heart. And, and whatever we're full of, that's what's going to come out. And if your spouse tells you you're full of it, they're probably not talking about the love of God. That may be other things, but there, there's times when we need to be full of the love of God. Amen? All right, there. That's my joke of the night. That's why I wouldn't te- on Saturday night. If we have sin or variations of sin, greed, bitterness, anger, jealousy, they will also flow out of us. No one can hide what's in their heart when they begin to speak, when they begin to share. It begins to come out. And sometimes we think, well, I didn't say that in front of anybody. But the reality is when you say it, you've spoken it into the atmosphere. When you say it with those who, I just need someone to talk to. I need to, I need to let this out. Well, what you're letting out is what's in your heart. And so you have to be able to examine your own heart and say, what's coming out of my mouth? Because we have to be honest with ourselves. Whatever's in our heart is going to end up coming out of our mouth. And without God's love overflowing out of our hearts, we can't love. We can't impact others. We can't touch lives. We We'll struggle. We'll not even have the anointing that needs to be there. See, we can be educated and we can have all the proper theories and we could sit and say, well, I, you know, I knew the Bible from, from Genesis to Revelations and I, I could quote all these things. But let me ask you this. Did you have any love? Because knowledge and love can be two separate things. And, and we can have paperwork, but paperwork doesn't qualify us. Uh, degrees don't qualify us. The approval of men doesn't qualify us. There's one thing that does qualify us. It's the love of God, though. Having his love. Because we all know those who have have tickled ears and have stimulated the minds. And whether it's, you know, a a form of entertainment or it just makes you think, oh, my goodness, they're so profound. There's such wisdom in those words. 
But let me ask you this, was there any love in those words? Was there any pure, genuine love? Because love is what destroys the yoke of bondage that sits in our life. And, and when you are hurting and when you're going through a tough time and when you're needing something, you don't need your ears tickled. What do you need? You need the love of God in your life poured out. You can have all the wisdom and know exactly what to say, but if there's no love in there, what does Paul say? You're a clanging, banging symbol. There's nothing there. There's no substance. And love isn't even a style because there's those who are from the deep south that know how to love, and there's those who are up in the northeast that have a different accent, but they know how to love, and there's those in California that can love. And they'll touch your heart just by speaking to you, and you know there's a real genuine love within them. And it's not a style. It's not a performance. It's not a show. You know love is real, don't you? You know when you walk in into a house that there's love in that house and, and there's love in the vo voice and the tone and the way you were received and there's a, there's a real love of God there. It's different. It's unique. You can't put your finger on it, but you know God's there. Something about it. And we know unlike love, lies, they, they've never had the power to set us free. They were used in the Old Testament from time to time to, to bind up hardened hearts and to steal we know in the New Testament, it steals, kills, and destroys. But Christ came to give us life. And, and the lies come in, and they, 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 they try to hinder us. And, and though it stimulates us, and there's something about our bodies that almost want to receive a lie. And we want to eliminate the equation of God from our lives. And, you know, we would, we would almost want to believe a lie. And the Bible says if you believe a lie, you can be damned. And, but there's something about that lie that comes out of someone's mouth that, Man, it just sounded so appealing, and I really want it to be truth. But there's a difference in real truth and a lie. And a, and a lie will bind you up, but the truth will set you free. And Jesus said this. He said, I am the truth. I am the truth. Over time, lies are uncovered. And Romans 1 tells us if we reject God, he will give us over to our own lust. And it actually will reveal who we are. Now, how soon that takes place, only God knows in his grace and mercy. I've seen some that have went on for years because the patience and the mercy and the grace of God. And there's others who've been called out immediately. I don't know how God does this, all these things. But I know one thing about it. God's word doesn't lie. He is true. 2 Peter 3.9 says this. God is patient. He's long-suffering that we would all repent. So in whatever state we're at, God truly wants to call us back. He wants us to come home. He wants us to repent. He wants us to embrace that heart of love. He wants to have that relationship. And as much as we want to reject it, and as I said, we... There's a part of us, our flesh, that before you ever came to Christ, that you rejected that cross. You rejected the name of Jesus. You didn't want to really embrace it because it took away from what you felt like was freedom. But it was such a lie of bondage, wasn't it? And you didn't even understand what love was. And, and then there was a day that you met him in an altar, and you really experienced love for the first time. And you, and, and you don't even know why you cried. You don't know why you wept. This is supposed to be a happy day, but you're crying, and you don't understand it. And you feel an overwhelming experience of love like you've never felt before. And it's not a love that you've watched on television in some pervert movie. This is a love that's genuine, that really cares about you. And you're overwhelmed with it. And it's, it's like a, maybe a, a mom or a dad. And there's a real pure love there that cares about you and accepts you just as you are. There's no judgment in this. There's a beautiful love. And it just surrounds you for the first time. And you look at that cross and you say, why do men hate that cross? Why do they hate the name of Christ? That is the most pure, beautiful, loving picture of anything. How can there be such a hatred for that? Because the Bible says there is a lie about that cross. There is a lie about Jesus, and there is a lie about what love is. And it is a damning lie that's out to destroy men and bind them. But there's only one thing that breaks it. There's only one thing that will destroy that yoke, and that is the pure love of God, the pure love of Jesus Christ tonight. Amen? Jesus said in Pilate's hall, he said this, I am the truth. I am the truth. He was love. He was walking in that. He was the perfect person. We know that a, a man's heart can be filled with so much other stuff, natural for us to all have sin in our hearts. We were born with a sin nature. And Galatians 5 and 19 through 21, it gives us a, a laundry list of, of sinful things that the flesh does. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. I mean, there's a list. Sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do 
There's an action word there. Those that do such things. Because how many know the heart will motivate us to not only say things, but the heart will motivate us to do things. So we know that not only does our heart determine what our mouth says, but our heart is going to motivate what we do. And God has a plan for your life. You were born with a purpose. You were born with a plan. But you were also born with the sin nature. And, and he draws us into that salvation. And that heart is transformed. And that's the plan of God. And the enemy wants to distract you along the way, though, doesn't he? He never wants you to understand what that symbol is all about. Just, just a simple two beans. He doesn't want you to understand what Christ stands for. He doesn't want you to understand what that love. He doesn't want you to feel that love. Because if you ever embrace the love of God, it will change you forever. He doesn't want that in your life. And so the enemy decides to distract you and give you interruptions. And I, I call it distractions because it's an interruption in your action. Because your action was to follow God. But a distraction takes you off the course. And so now you're doing something different than what you ever designed to do. See, the distraction designed to keep us from the God-given destiny, keep us from the fulfilling the life of God has for each of us because God has a plan. And the enemy wants to do nothing more than waste your time. He just loves to waste your time. Waste the days, waste the hours, waste the years. Let it tick by because man has an appointed time. And then cometh the judgment. And if he can waste all that time and your purpose and your plan can be destroyed, but Proverbs 3, 5 tells us to trust in the Lord, to not, to not sit there and listen to these things. See, when we walk after the flesh, we miss the heart of God. And that's what the enemy would want us to do. He wants us to act out in that way. We damage our own lives. We damage the lives of people around us. We, as you saw on the news today, the, the, the man in Florida, he just recklessly goes out and destroys other people's lives. That's what sin does. It's an action. Man can't explain it. We can't understand what what's going on in that, and I would encourage you with this. Instead of asking why God, how about we just pray for those families? There's no, you're not going to have a perfect answer. You're not going to debate these things. Far greater than us have tried. But I know this as I was walking around the, the circle today, and I, I thought to myself, how do you give an answer to why God dropped this in my spirit? How about not ask why? How about just pray for the families? That's a lot more effective. We could debate things till we're blue, but here's what's effective, prayer. Amen. That's what God's word teaches us to do. So we're to pray, and we know that the enemy would love to distract, and here's lives destroyed, and, and families destroyed, and homes destroyed, and the enemy wants us to walk a plank of disaster. Some have shorter planks than others, and perhaps you're walking that plank tonight, or perhaps you've just made the U-turn and said, whoa, I was close. I, I don't know how long it is for everybody. I do know this, that there is a point, and he wants to distract us from the main action. And what is that main action? To have a, a relationship with God. And so the distraction is to pull you away from the main action. And action was the plan God had for your life. So we see that. And the Bible reminds us that God can even give us a new heart. He can give us a new heart. And I love Ezekiel 36 where he says this. And he, he says in verse 26, And I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. And I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you, give you a heart of flesh there. Remove the, the hardened heart, the stubborn heart, the prideful heart. Because nobody wants to admit they have pride. That's like the last thing anybody wants to say, I've got pride. But the reality is, it's there, my friend. We have it. And he says, I want to remove that. I want to give you a new heart. And, and we try to figure it out. And... And I don't know about you, but I, I, I didn't come to the Lord at 7, and, and I haven't walked with him all my life. It was, it was closer to 27. And, and so in my 20s, I tried to figure out every way around that cross. And I tried to figure out ways to, ways to feel okay with life. And, you know, there was a conviction there. There was something that was missing. There was a huge gap in my, a hole in my heart. And I tried to figure out ways to solve it and to fill it and to satisfy it. But there's nothing that will satisfy you like the love of God. There's nothing that will fulfill you like the love of God. And how many know this? The older you get, the more fear tries to creep in. But what does the Bible say about love? Perfect love cast out all fear. Because I would see people and say, how can they be so courageous? Why aren't they afraid? But God's love takes that away. I'm telling you, it feel, fills your heart. He says, I can give you a new heart. And one thing about love is you have to be patient. And, you know, God checked me on this. 
And I just say this, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to be patient. You know, Jesus Christ was never in a hurry. He never said, oh, I'm running late, guys. I got to hurry up and get, oh, get over here. Where they, you know, there's, there's something to do, and sorry, I don't have time. And he's getting ready to be crucified, and, and he's talking with people, but he still takes time to talk to a woman who's got five, five husbands. He's, he's got, he takes time along the journey. He always had time for people to turn their life. He always had time to share his love. Jesus was never in a hurry. He was patient. And, you know, in, in our busy, everyday lives, and, you know, sometimes you got your little task list, and, and you know, I've been convicted about that, and sometimes I can be too task-oriented and, and not enough enjoying the journey of life. And I began to think, you know, Christ, you were never in a hurry. You were never anxious. You were never worried. And, yes, I know he's Jesus Christ. <laughs> However, how did he do that? Let me tell you how he did it. He walked in perfect love. He had no worries. He knew God the Father was with him. He had a perfect trust in God, and he was confident in everything that was going to take place. And he knew that if he did the will of the Father, and we know that the will of the Father is that all men come to repentance, he never, never, it was never a hassle to take the time to share and talk to someone along the journey. Sometimes we as Christians in America have just gotten way too much in a hurry. And we are often acting out of something that's not of our Father. And this is why I say to you, we have to examine ourselves and say, do we really love God as much as we say we do? Do we really have as much love in us as we want and say we have? And perhaps we need to examine the love that we have for God and ask him to refill us and take this heart and refresh it and give us a new heart of love, as the scripture tells us. Amen? Romans, Romans 5 and 8 says this, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that is one of the main stones in the Romans road there. While we were sinners, he died for us. I want you to think about that. This was something he didn't do because of what you did. And so many times we flip the gospel around and, and we say we love God, but we try to manipulate God. And we say, well, God, if I do this, I'm expecting you to do that. You have to, and you're bound by your word, God, and I'm going to manipulate you. And how many know that God has every loophole covered in the book? He'll do what he wants to do. <laughs> Man, don't sit there and, and point your finger in his chest too much, Job, because he'll talk back to you one day. And I, I do know this, though, that he did love us first. He loved us with a, a passionate love, and he went to the cross without even knowing, giving you a free will to make a decision. And inside of that, you know, he has given us a choice to react to that love. And inside of that, as we react, you know, that's why when we, we get born again, there ought to be a change inside of us. People, whenever they look at you, they say, you have come to Christ. You are a believer. When we make that announcement, they, they want to know that there's a change, that you ought to be different than what you were yesterday, that you ought to be different than what you were five, ten years ago. You ought to be getting deeper in love with God. You ought to be growing with him because that heart of love, he planted something in there, seeds of faith, seeds of hope, seeds of love, and it ought to be blossoming something out of our lives. And our lives ought to be putting off something called the fruit of the Spirit, which we'll go over. But that ought to be growing up and, and producing. And, and, and one of the things I've, I've often thought is that everybody's got a fruit of the Spirit, a strength in some area. There's something you've got inside of you. God gave you that gift for something. Some of you know how to love people that are unlovable. Some of you know how to be patient with people that nobody can be patient with. Some of you are, are long-suffering and gentle and kind and all things. But there's something that you're bearing fruit of because there is a tree on the inside of you that is growing up of, in love. And God has put it in there. And we are, we are reacting to that love. And so, you know, as the enemy wants to distract you, God just calls you to react. And he says, I loved you before you were born. He said, I loved you first. I died for you while you were a sinner. And we come to, a, a, we come to a, an altar. We come... We come repenting, whether it was in your car, whether it was in your home, praying beside your bed when your mom led you, whatever it was, but you came and you reacted to the love that he had because that love drew you in, and you react to that love. 
And I'm telling you, every day you ought to have an opportunity to react to it because his love is renewed each day. It's continuing to pour out in our lives, and we have an opportunity to renew that, to react to his love. I don't want to react to what the enemy's doing. I want to react to what God's doing. And let me tell you what God's doing every day. He is loving on you. He is loving in your life. He is putting the fruit of the Spirit in you. And that's what I want to react to, the love of God. We want to react. And Pastor Mark explained that wonderfully in a theatrical performance. There's an act and then there's a react. They, they do the same thing. And so what we're, all we're trying to do is react what he's done to me. What has he done to me? Oh, he was, he was loving to me, so I need to be loving to others. He forgave me. I need to forgive others. He was patient with me. I need to be patient with others. So we're just trying to react. And how many know we're not all the best actors in the room, are we? There's a whole lot of better actors sometimes, and sometimes my acting stinks. But I do know this. He gives me a fresh day every morning. He, he renews it every day, and he says, John, I want you to try again. And the Bible says I may fall six, seven times, but guess what? He picks me back up every day and gives me another chance to walk in the love of God that he has put in my life. Man, it's a beautiful thing that we'll turn over and react to the love that he has, has given us. Galatians 5.22 reminds us, as we look a little bit further down in Galatians, not just the fruits of the flesh, which cause us to act, but there's fruits of the spirit, which cause us to act. And it says this, you know, with a new heart, uh, the Bible says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, temperance, Against such things there is no law. And they that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, that's an action. Let us walk in that thing. Let us do something with it. It's not that we're just saying, hey, I'm saved, but I'm doing whatever I want. I'm walking in the Spirit now. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let our hearts be so full of love that there's no room for anything else. I don't want any room for anything else. I really want the love of God. And you know what? That is a process. It's a process. I, I remember we get a lot of calls, and they're from all over the place. And someone called in one day, and they, they said, you know what? I, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit over the phone. Because I know this was, you know, the church of, of Dr. Summerall. And I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and I just began to talk and ask a few questions. And, and this person said, I don't go to church anymore. Those, I hate those people. I don't like any of them. And I won't, I won't step foot in a church anywhere. And I said, well, what would be the purpose of God filling you? <laughs> well, I want to throw these demons out of my house. <laughs> and, and my first thought was, well, are you going first? But I, I, <laughs> that was just, I know that wasn't reacting. I'm sorry. I, but that was my thought, okay? It was just a real, what do you want with this? I mean, because the Bible talks about us edifying and equipping one another. I mean, if I've got love, it's not just love myself or love my It's just so that I can love other people. And as we come in the body of Christ, we're supposed to be love and equipping, correcting in love, correcting in love. Because how many know you can't go to somebody angry? You have to go to them in love. And, and if you can't go to them in love, you can't go to them. That's, I learned that a long time ago. I could get mad at somebody, but I will never come to you angry. I promise you that. I will only come to you after I've prayed through and I really feel the genuine love of God. I would never talk to someone angry because I will not be in me. I will not be what God wants me to be. But you have to go to someone in love. You can't talk to your kids in anger. You can't talk to your spouse in anger. You can't talk to your boss in anger. You go to them in love. Take it to the Father. He'll put the love of God. If you're a born-again believer, he'll put the love there. And if, he, and if you can't feel that love there, you better hold off till you get through praying. That's my free tip of the day. <laughs> the, love, the love of God will begin to blossom as we minister. The fruits of the Spirit, it's an action. We begin to minister to others. The joy of the Lord will, will not be based on our feelings, but on his promises. Man, you know what? There's a lot of bad things going on in this world, but does, does it mean that I'm moping around in gloom and doom? No. There is, a, there is a joy on the inside of me. I know the end result. Like Paul writing the letter in the Roman prisons with the waist going below him and up to his knees in it, he still had a love and he still had a joy that who can explain that only but God? 
the peace when there's war all raging around you, the long suffering will there be when you want to quit the ministry, the job, the families, and you get no glory or no thanks. But guess what? You're long suffering. That's a fruit of the Spirit rising up. Gentleness will rise up when you're offended, cut off, even done wrong by those around you. There's goodness that's going to rise up when you feel your heart and opportunities arise to do things that are good. Faith will be there when the props are blown out from under us. Whenever doubt is in every mouth around you, faith can rise up. You can be that voice of faith. Sometimes, like David, you have to just speak it to yourself and know that everybody wants to kill you and everybody says it's over. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes you just got to get the scriptures out and get the wheel rolling and get it turning. Crank it up. It'll get there. Come on. You build that faith up. The meekness will fill your heart when others are patting you on the back. And the reality is you know God used you, and it wasn't you, but it was God that filled your mouth. Temperaments will fill your heart when you're tempted beyond measure and when you're walking in the blessing, but the enemy wants to come to knock you off where God has placed you. But you have temperance in there. See, all these seeds growing up in the beautiful trees of our heart, producing fruit for others to, to be nourished and strengthened in the body of Christ to receive all these things. Your heart can hold the blessings because it's pure. Because there is a bountiful harvest inside of your heart. Because when your heart is full of love, it's going to stay preserved. But when your heart is full of wickedness, everything's rotten. It comes out of your mouth. It's in your actions. There is no fruit of the Spirit. It's rotten. It's like a trash can. But when there's a real fruit, there's, there's, there's nutrition. There's value. There's love. There's, there's an anointing that's in your life. And love is what we need. 1 Corinthians 13.1. I believe Mac even started to speak with this a little bit, and I, res I referred to it earlier. It says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I sometimes think to myself, do away with some of these conferences. How about the church just know how to love one another? How about the church just know how to love people, period? Let's have a conference and teach people how to love. That's kind of a basic element. And they say, well, I'm bored with that. I want more. I want all this. And I, that There's something in the heart that's not right. Get back to the basics of God. When you've got love down, then you can go forward. He says, if I give everything away that I have, and if I'm delivered up my body to be burned, but have not love, I've gained absolutely nothing. Love is patient, it's kind, love does not envy or boast, love is not arrogant, it's never rude, it's never rude, <laughs> love is not rude. I felt, I don't know why God has you repeat things sometimes, like somebody, remember in school when the teacher just kept going over it? Okay, that was, anyway, it's, love does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable, it's not resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, they'll pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But what does God's word say? The greatest of these is love. It really is. It is the most powerful force. If we can fill our hearts so full of love, there's no room for anything else. Our prayer should be for God to remove this heart of flesh and give us the heart of pure love. A heart that desires the best for other people. A, part, a heart that is, is, is quick to not point out what is wrong, but to appreciate what is right. And to be thankful in all things. To know the, God, the, the plan that God has for you and what you were given as at your, in your heart to do. I mean, there's, there's really some basic elementary things that God wants us to do. He wants us to obey God's word. I mean, there's only a couple things that are going to last forever. And one of them is the word of God. We ought to obey it. The other is your soul. So get, get down in you the word of God because that's what's going to last forever. Nothing else is going to last but the word of God and your soul. And to obey God's word, guess what this requires? 
loving people. To obey God's word, you have to love people. There's ten commandments. Four of them have to do with us loving God. Six of them have to do with us loving people. It's pretty cut and dry. We ought to love people. Number two, we ought to edify and equip the church. And that requires what? Requires what? Loving people. To edify and equip and even correction, as I stated earlier. Man, that's, if I see you doing something wrong and I can't come to you, I can't truly say I love you. And if someone does come to you and corrects you in love, they really do love you. It's, it's your parents that loved you that said, I wasn't your buddy and your pal. They was the ones that took you to the side and whipped the fire out of you because they loved you. It didn't seem loving in the moment, did it? But it was good for you when they washed your mouth out with soap. It was good for you when they took away your Atari. It was good. I'm talking to the older generation right now, so they got to be relevant, right? It was good for you when they didn't let you go cruising on a Friday night. It was good for you when correction comes in place. You have to love people to correct them. You have to love people to edify them. You have to love people to build them up. You have to love people. Number three, to share the good news of his love for a lost world. Guess what that requires? Loving people. How can you witness and talk to someone and share the gospel if you don't have any love in your heart for them? Because when you look at a person and you say to yourself, I don't know you, you, you truly don't know them, but all you know is this, that was a child of God made in his image that has a plan that God has mapped out for eternity. And if you don't share that gospel, they may spend eternity in damnable hell, but God has sent you for such a time to share the good news. And you say, I love you. You don't know them, and they don't even understand what love is when you say that. But you know in your heart that you love that person enough to see them. Because why? Because he loves them. God cares about them, and they were made to be a part of eternity. The bottom line is this. To work for God, you'll need to have a lot of love for people and full of love to last. And it has to be ongoing, renewed daily, reacting daily, every day to his love. You know, someone can't preach the gospel and not have any love for people. you got to love people you got to love people to do any ministry because people will do what? They'll wear you out. People will frustrate you. People will aggravate you. But you got to get up every day and react his love. Oh, but you're patient with me. You're long-suffering. You're gentle with me. You're loving to me. And every day, God, that's right, you love me first. And guess what I need to do? React. And I need to do what you're doing. That's the calling that you've given. Amen. A heart that's quick to serve, humble. And loves to build, over, build, build up others. Not a heart full of pride or one that looks to gain from others. Not a heart that looks what it can get. And, you know, I've, I've shared this many times. Uh, the consumer mentality is our nation. And we just devour things. And if you ever go to a landfill and watch the trucks just come in and unload trash by the truckloads. I mean, they can't keep up with the trash. Because we are a nation that is consuming. We are devouring we are gobbling up everything and the food that this country goes. And it's not just that, but we don't stop there. We want entertainment. We want, we want stuff. We want it now, and we want what we want. And so we go through relationships. We go through people. We go through churches. We, we devour everything because the consumer mentality is what we were raised up to believe. But that is a contradiction to God's word. We are investors. We are builders. We are equippers. We are not destroyers. We are not tearing things down. We are building up things. We want to be an investor. And we have got a living fruit on the inside of us that's full of love. I, I taught on, um, in Sunday school this last week in Genesis 29 how Jacob loved Rachel and served seven years. But what does the Bible say? It was just a few moments to him. Why was it just a few moments? Seven years, why was it just a few moments? Because he had a love for his wife that he was to have. And when you love something, it's just but a few years. And the point is this. I see couples that are married 50, 60 years, and they say, you know what? Life just flew by. It was just, seems like we just got married yesterday, hon. And we say, oh, that's, I want that. You know what you want? You want the love that they have. Because love like that makes life just seem like just a few moments. It was here and it was gone. Because the love is just there. And we all want that love, don't we? We all want that relationship that Jacob had for Rachel. To be an investor, to have a love. And I want to tell you this, the greatest magnet you can ever be is to have a heart full of love. I'm telling you, the greatest magnet, if you want to attract people, 
And I'm not talking about like attracting people <laughs> for a relationship. But just be a, a person that people like and be around is to have a heart full of love. There is nothing more attractive, nothing more respected. There's nothing more sought off after than to have a heart of love. Because what does the word tells us, and I'm not going to read the scripture, but it, it tells us beauty is deceptive. Charm, I believe. We know money is appealing, talent, power, and influence as well. But there is something about a genuine person who loves. Because let me just tell you this. Your grandma, I mean, she had good cookies, but that's not what you liked about grandma. Grandma loved you unconditionally. And that's what you loved about grandma. She had an unconditional love, and she had a love that came from above. And that's what you felt when you walked in the house. And that's what attracted, and that's what you miss, and that's what you long to be. So full of that love that there's room for nothing else. Amen. I'm going to close with this. 1 Samuel 13 and 14 says this. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Now think about that. What was God looking for? Not only is it those in this world that look for love, but God is looking for someone after his own heart. So full of love. I hear people all the time say they want to be used by God. It's very simple. Just let your heart be so full of love, God will use you. I promise you that. He will fulfill the desires of your heart. Let your heart be so full of love, there's room for nothing else. Today we, we close up, and I, I ask you this, to examine your own heart. I want to just give us a little bit of time to, to pray. I believe prayer is a powerful thing. And, and sometimes we come into church, and we, we come in, and we, we rush out, and we really miss that really intimate time with God. I could spend a weekend in a conference and hear a lot of good teaching, a lot of good preaching, and spend hours listening to YouTube sermons. But in just, just a few moments with the Lord on my knees, man, God can speak something to me. And I want to tell you the one thing he did speak to me was this, to let your heart, he said, John, I let your heart be so full of love there's room for nothing else. That was a word for me. Maybe that's a word for you. But I know this, that there's times that other things try to creep in my heart to try and fill the void, to try and grow and push out the love. And I'm trying to ask God every day to let my heart be so full of love that there's room for absolutely nothing else. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, I ask you just to speak to hearts and lives in this room today. Lord, that we would examine our hearts. Lord, that we would truly desire to have a heart so full of love that there's room for nothing else. God, I pray tonight as we close this service out that you'll speak to them. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts and lives. Fill them afresh with the love of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to come around this altar. Find yourself a place to kneel, pray, stand, lift your hands, whatever you might do. If you're uncomfortable coming to an altar, just kneel at your pew. Just close your eyes. But listen to the words of this song, and let's just worship Jesus Christ. And let's just focus on that true, intimate love of God that's so pure. It's not perverse. It's right. It's righteous. And let the love of God overflow our hearts tonight.